Let us open our Bibles on Genesis chapter 33. Genesis chapter 33. I hope I have an expectation to do the entire chapter today. I have a very poor track record on that. <laughs> my, my track record is absolutely horrible. But I will still try. Genesis chapter 33, the entire chapter we shall read. Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were four hundred men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maid servants. And he put the maid servants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maid servants came near, they and their children, and bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. Afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. Then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, No, please. If I had now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand. And as much as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me, please take my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. So he urged him, and he took it. Then Esau said, Let us take our journey, let us go. And I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are weak, and the flocks and herds which are nursing are with me. And if the man should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly at the pace which the livestock that go before me, and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. And Esau said, Now let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, What need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. And Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth, built himself a house, and made booths with his life for his life, livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkoth. Then Jacob came safely to the city of Sheshem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padam Aram. And he pitched his, pitched his tent before the city. And he bought the parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor. Sheshem's father, for one hundred pieces of money. Then he erected an altar there and called it El Elohe Israel. So far the reading of the most blessed word of the Lord. Oh, well, the last time Jacob heard from Esau was twenty years before this event, isn't it? Twenty years ago, so to speak, Jacob heard from his brother, that his brother was very sad, very disappointed, and his brother found a consolation. I will break that man's neck as soon as our father die. That was his consolation. Esau was consoling himself, saying, I will kill my brother as soon as my father dies, and then I will clear the record. I will clean the air before, between us. 20 years has passed. What did those 20 years do? Did those 20 years serve 
to calm down Esau's heart, did the 20 years serve to make him think, you know, not bygones, you bygones, you know? Water under the bridge. Did, did the 20 years do that? Or did the 20 years gave, give um, Esau a hundred different ways of killing his brother slowly? What, what did the 20 years do? We don't know. We read here, and have you noticed that this chapter 32 and chapter 33, it really looks like they were designed to keep us on our toes as we read them. But they don't give us that much information. Have you noticed that? We don't know. Oh, the, 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 the servants of Jacob bring back the report. 400 men are coming. Well, to do what? We don't know. And then Esau's, uh, Esau sees Jacob. Until the moment that he actually runs and falls on his neck and kisses him and cries, we don't know what's going to happen. So when we read this, we are kept on the edge of our seat the entire chapter until we read that. Now we see that God did way more than we could have ever expected, than Jacob could have expected. Now, when you read... If you go back with me on your Bibles, please go with me to chapter 32, the chapter before. Huh? Look at verse 11. Look, look at how Jacob was praying before. Jacob was praying like this. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him. So Jacob, Jacob's request was, God, just don't let him kill me. Just let me live. God, if as long as I don't die, I, I, I'm okay. That was Jacob's prayer. Jacob was saying, God, just, just let me live. And, we, then, and I'm good. And I'm good. I, I'm okay. I just want to live. And now Esau sees the brother. Now, before Esau even saw the brother, Jacob even took more precautions. See, Jacob had just wrestled with the angel of God, which is Jesus Christ himself, in a pre-incarnate moment. Okay, I have already explained this. Jesus Christ miraculously appeared there. That, that's it. He took a body, a physical body, just to be there at that moment. That's it. We know that's a physical body because they were wrestling. You, you cannot wrestle with a a non-physical entity, okay? So, I mean, and then and the physical entity hurt him on the joint of the hip. So it was a physical, there was a physical body there. Jesus was there wrestling with Jacob. Now Jacob still had some concerns. Is God going to deliver me? Well, I hope so, but what would that deliverance look like? Is God going to, you know, just let me live, but not my children, or maybe half of my children will, you know, he doesn't know. So he devises a plan. Now, Jacob, Jacob apparently died with this sin. Have you noticed the way he divided his children? He takes the maid servants and the children put in front. And then he takes Leah, which is not the one that he liked the most. He liked her the less than, the, than Rachel. And put Leah and her children behind. And then puts Rachel and Joseph all the way on the back. So he's thinking, okay, those are the ones that have the greatest chance of escaping. So he's still playing favorites. He's still showing favoritism among the wives and the children. Now, I'm sure you guys remember what will happen to his children, right? On the future, 10 of the children, okay, Joseph was number 11, Benjamin was number 12. So the first 10 will try to kill Joseph. And then on the middle of the process, they thought, you know, maybe we are overdoing this. Let's just sell him into slavery. Let's be kind. Let's sell the guy to slavery. And, and that's it. So the 10, the children of Leah, the children of the two maidservants, 
the, those ten children, they will sell Joseph to slavery. They didn't do anything to Benjamin because Jan Benjamin was way too young. He was most like a toddler at the time. So what we see here is that his children and his wives, they all knew who was Jacob's favorite. Among the wives and among the children. Now, one thing that I have learned on, of my life, I have not lived that long. I'm only 35. I'm not, I, one day I remember I said this to a friend of mine. You know, in my entire life, I've never, and the person interrupted me and said, you say this as if you to have such an amazing life experience, don't you? But honestly, on my little bit, on my few years, I have noticed one thing. Every time I hear stories in which a father or a mother showed favoritism, played favorites, all the, those stories end really well, really bad, really poor. Really, really poor. Here's what usually happens. The children, the children who actually have a distorted view of God. Because you see, if my father on earth plays favorites, Maybe my father in heaven play favorites. That's the worst part. When a father or mother shows favoritism among the children, you are actually communicating the following. God is like this, which is a lie, which is a heresy. God is not like that. And if God is not like that, you don't have the right to act so. But that's the message that is communicated. But Felipe, I never said that. Well, you never said with words. You never said it with words. No, indeed. But since when communication is done through words alone? We all know it's not. We all know it's not. So that's problem number one. Problem number two. The, it causes the child to develop a toxic relationship with the parent. The child will think, I'm, my father likes that sibling more than I, or my mother likes that sibling more than I, because I'm not good enough. So they become people pleasers. They, 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 they want to go to the ends of the earth, not for the sake of obedience and love, but because they want to gain the father or mother's love. And that never, do you know why they'll never reach that? They'll never be successful. They are fighting a battle that they lost already. Because the problem was never on them. The problem was on the father or mother. The problem was on the parent. It doesn't matter what he does. He can, I don't know, give them, mount, give them mountains of gold, obey every single word to the, to, to the minute details, it will never be enough. And now, number three, which also happens, often they tend to hate the sibling that is favored. Because they'll think, well, my father doesn't love me much because of you. You are the source of my problems, sibling of mine. So they hate, they hate the sibling. By the time they realize that the problem was never the sibling, the problem was never them, the problem was on the parent, by the time they realize that usually they're already grown up. They're already, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years old, if that. And then they are, they are already filled with traumas. Now, isn't it amazing that God had just changed, changed Jacob's name? God just came to him and said, from now on, you're not Jacob, you're Israel. You are a new person. You have a new identity from now on. And his first act is the act of playing favorites. What does that tell you? That tells you and I that forever we are in a... Forgive me, not forever. For as long as we are on this earth, for as long as we are on this side of heaven, we will not be done on our walk of sanctification. Sanctification is a lifelong process. And we are colossal fools if we think that we don't have a lot to work on that regard. Now, you see, Jacob had plenty of reasons. If I would be Jacob at this time, I know myself. If I would be Jacob at this time, 
I would be so, you know, inflated. If somebody would have a pin, I would blow up, you know. God just changed my name. God just changed my name. I mean, do you want a better, uh, greater compliment than that? God changed his name. And there he is, playing favorites. Now, he actually was a little bit better than his father and his grandfather. Abraham played favorites, didn't he? He did. Isaac played favorites, didn't he? He did. It, no scenario. No, Jacob will play favorites. All the three cases, very problematic. Problems that are undescribable. Now, at least, but Abraham was a coward. He used his wife as a human shield, you remember? Isaac used his wife, as a, his wife as a human shield. But on that regard, Jacob is actually better. Surprise, surprise. Jacob was more of a man than Abraham and Isaac. And he, you see this? Look at this. Uh, verse 3. Then he, chapter 33, verse 3. Then he, Jacob, crossed over before them. Now, if it, this would have been Abraham or Isaac, I would imagine, okay, you guys go ahead. If, they kill, if Esau kills you, I run away. But no, Jacob was actually a good man here. A courageous man. A cor playing favorites. But he was a courageous man. Now, we see here that he bowed himself to the ground seven times. Now, first I'm going to com comment the bowed, the bowing, and then I'm going to comment the seven times. First, the bowing itself. Isn't that the opposite of what he actually wanted his entire life? When he stole the blessing from his brother, which is on chapter 27, verse 29. When Isaac blessed him, Isaac said the following, Let peoples serve you, and nations bow down to you. Now listen to this. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. That's what he stole. He stole that blessing. But now, we see him, we see Jacob, out of his own volition, bowing before his brother. He had just called his brother Lord, over and over and over on the previous chapter. And now he is bowing. Now, we see that he bowed seven times. That's the proper protocol when meeting royalty at that time, particularly the Egyptian royalty. When somebody would come to have an audience with Pharaoh, I mean, usually it goes like this. Let's say, let's say the throne is all the way there, and I enter the room here, then I bow one time, then I walk a little bit more, and I bow again, then I walk a little bit more, and I bow again. So you bow seven times before you come near the, the royal figure, the royal person that you want to have an audience with. Jacob did exactly that. He treated his brother as his king, as his lord, as he was actually saying before. Why was he doing that? He wanted to say, brother, I left here a thief, thief in, I left here trying to take advantage of you. Now I return with gifts, and I recognize that you are my Lord. But isn't that what Jesus said to us? If you want to be above others, then be lower than them. If you want to be above them, you serve them. If you want to be master, you serve them. If you want to be great, you serve more than everybody else. Jesus tells us that in the Christian environment, that a Christian mindset is precisely the opposite as any other mi mindset. Which, I'm sorry, which company in the planet works like that? None. If any of you work on any company, you know that that's not how companies work. Usually in companies, if you wanna, if you wanna grow, you don't let anybody take credit for your own work. And when you do something nice, you make sure your boss hears that you're the guy that did that. 
And I'm not particularly complaining about that. But I'm saying in a Christian mindset, on the Christian church, in, on the hearts of Christians, we must be countercultural. But Felipe, what if, what if that bothers me getting ahead of my business? Oh, the answer is quite simple. We are the religion of the cross. We are not the religion of the bucket of gold. We are not the religion of pillows. We are not the religion of Rolls Royce. We are not the religion of richness. We are the religion of the cross. Did you know that actually Muslims call us people of the cross? Sometimes people of the cross, sometimes people of the book. That's exactly who we are. They, I, call, I salute them for calling us the people of the cross and the people of the book. Now, we cannot have a religion whose greatest event was actually a crucifixion and say, well, I cannot do what the Bible says because I need to get ahead on life. It doesn't work like that. Not, not, not even close. Not even close. But we see now, number one, the work of God. And number two, that Esau indeed had a magnanimous act. He was big hearted. Esau, was, he, he did phenomenally well. Look at verse 4 with me. Please physically take a look. Look with your eyes. Take a look at verse 4 there. But Esau, now look at the verbs. Look at the verbs, how packed they are. You see, when, when I say a whole lot of verbs, one after the other, what idea do you get? That it's a fast-moving event. And he walked, and he, pa and, he, and he walked, and he talked, and he cleaned, and he ate, and he slept, and he woke up. So it's a fast thing. It looks like if this is a movie, it, it, this is the top, this is the climax of the event, of the whole, I don't know, 30, 40, maybe the entire movie, 30, 40 minutes, maybe the entire two hours, whatever. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. You see, all these verses, all these verbs like, tum, tum, and he ran and he saw and he hugged and he kissed and he wept. It was a big moment. Oof. You read this, you're almost sweating, just picturing the scenario, picturing the event. Now, beyond, if I were a self-help a self preacher, I would be looking at all the psychological analysis here, and I would give you a, a, a very flowery uh, um, speech about the beauty of, of kindness and, and generosity and, you know, being the bigger person. And that's all. To a certain extent, a very small extent, actually, that's okay. To a very small extent. But the number one message here is, look at what God did. Look at what God did. Not A, not Esau, God. Jacob was saying, God, would you spare my life? That was Jacob's request. And what did God do? God not only caused Jacob's life and the life of his family to be spared, but God caused Jacob's brother to be reconciled with him, to cry, to kiss him, to fall on his neck. Guys, do you have any idea how bombastic this moment is? How fantastic this moment is? Do you know how old are these guys? Ninety. They were born a few, I don't know, maybe a few minutes apart from each other, so... They share a birthday, right? They, they're twins. 90, they're 90. Apparently still super strong. I mean, if Esau climbed on a horse to lead 400 people, you don't really have 400 people following a guy that can hardly stand, okay? So these are super strong guys at 90. Big white beard, strong men. Super rich, both of them, super rich. And here they are running, falling on the ground. And this was not a ground that was nicely cleaned. This is the dirt. They fell on the dirt. 
They wept, they cried, and they killed each other. God did that. God did that. Jacob's prayer was so simple. God, let me live. God's reply was, I'll let you live. I'll let your family live. I'll give you back your brother. And I will cause your brother to go to, running to you, kissing you, and weeping. And here's the best part. After he weeps, and they kiss, and they, and they make peace, not even once Esau said, Jacob, I'm happy that you're back, but you know about that stuff from the past? We got to talk that over, you know? He didn't do that. He didn't do that. For Jacob, for Esau, it was water under the bridge, period. Period. That actually reminds me of what my Hebrew professor told me this week. I was talking to him about, I asked him for how long he was a pastor and he is a professor now. And he told me that he was not doing pastoral work because he was 100% focusing on his, study, on his teaching job as a Hebrew professor. And I asked him, uh, a, and I asked him, well, so do you miss that a lot? And how, how does it work for you? And he said, Felipe, I love preaching. And I get to preach very often. I absolutely love preaching. But when it comes to counseling, I'm a bit too much straightforward. And I asked him, what does that mean? And he said, here's my view of how counseling should go. Somebody comes to me and tells me they have a problem. I would give them two advices. Number one, read your Bible. Number two, get over it. So he said, I don't know if that's really that good. But you see, that's more or less what happened here. Yes, so he got over it. He, yeah, indeed. Jacob did something horrible. But did Esau come to him and say, you know, we've got to talk that over, sir. No. Bygones or bygones. Now, observe one thing. And two more. This was, so, this was such a fantastic episode. And God worked so wonderfully that Esau is not, nowhere on the Bible, Esau is displayed as a Christian man or as a God-fearing man. Nowhere on the Bible. Nowhere on the Bible we see Esau given as an example of somebody that feared the God of Israel or the God of Isaac or the God of Abraham. Nowhere. But this man, I mean, you, do you, don't you remember the parable of the prodigal son? When the prodigal son came back, how did Jesus describe the father? An old rich man that was at the window waiting, right? And he ran, he fell on the son's neck and kissed the son. Ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. Exactly like this. I'm not saying that Esau is a type of Christ. I'm not saying that. But here's what I'm saying. Christ described God's actions, God's heart of forgiveness, using the same vocabulary that Moses used to describe how a man that was not even God-fearing forgave others. What is the point that I'm trying to bring across here? The point I'm trying to bring across here is even a man that doesn't have the fear of God in his heart was able to forgive now, this should be a great warning for us. We should be humbled. You and I must be humbled by this scenario, by this event. Wow, there is a man that doesn't fear God, and yet Jesus described God's heart of forgiveness just like Moses described him. So if a non-Christian, if a non-God-fearing man acts this way, well, how much, how much is my case? How much more should I forgive? And Jesus goes a step further. Jesus said, Jesus said, if you don't forgive others what they have done to you, you can forget about God forgiving you. Forget about it. 100%. Esau was quite beautiful in this moment here. 
but much more beautiful than Esau, God. God was much more beautiful. Because it was God who did this. It was God who did this. And then he lifted his eyes, and then he saw the children who are these, and Jacob gave a wonderful reply. Look at the reply of Jacob on chapter, on verse 5. The children whom God has graciously given your servant. That, this translation is correct. However, there are other translations that I would prefer. Particularly one that says, these are the children whom God has favored your servant. Jacob is big on this word. Later on, this, Jacob is going to use this word more times. When he asked, why, why did you send me all those animals? He said, I send them, verse 8, on the end of verse 8. These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. Jacob is a guy that is big on the word favor. I want to be favored. What is this word? How is this word used? What is the point of this word? What is the message here? To be favored is not, it's, to not be on a neutral capacity in relation to somebody else. But it is to actually, indeed, be favored. Not only to be looked upon with kindness, but to receive the person's active benefits. Now, maybe, maybe you think good of me. You have a good impression of me. But if you favor me, you would be doing some things for me. If I favor you, I'll be doing something for, some things for you. I'll be giving you gifts. I'll be walking an extra mile with you because I favor you. That's the point of the word favor. It's, it's an active positivity from one person to another. Something that can be seen. And Jacob is saying, God favored me with all these 11 children. Actually, 12 already. Dina was already there, so the little girl. Observe that this is not what the word say about children, is it? According to Jacob and according to the Bible as a whole, children are a gift from God. Children are a gift from God. Psalm number 127, verse 4, says the following. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. Let me ask you this. Let me say you are going to battle. Let me say you're going to battle and your weapon of choice or the weapon given to you is the bow and arrow. How many arrows are you going to take? The least amount possible or the highest amount possible? The answer is obvious, isn't it? You're going to put arrow. You're going to have arrows coming out of the wazoo. You're, like, you're going to have arrows everywhere. You want as many arrows as you can carry them. Because when it comes to the, to the fight... You need arrows. Otherwise you are dead. Any battle, and forgive me, any warrior take as many possible guns as you can take. Now here's the mindset of the world. Yeah, children nowadays, they're quite expensive. So I'm going to have as least as possible. And another one that I heard, even from Christians, why would I want to bring children into this messed up world? That's why you want to bring children. Because the world is messed up. And if we want the world to be more like Christ commands, what do you do? You need more people to help you. Jesus himself said, Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers. Now, the child, a Christian should raise his child. Now, you see, I call this, you see, there is a mindset of the wolf and the mindset of the chicken. And some Christians, they have the mindset of the chicken. My children will be eaten by the word. No. We as Christians, we have to have the following mindset. My boy is going to crush it. My boy or my girl will be the best Christian ever. This man or this girl 
I'm going to teach him so well. I'm going to love him so much. I'm going to tell him about Jesus so much that he's going to be amazing. He's going to be a natural born evangelist. He's going to preach the gospel so well. He's going to be used to bring hundreds of people to Christ. You see the difference of mindset? Warrior mindset. Chicken mindset. Oh, so many influences on the mindset of my boy. Now Jacob, Jacob saw, I'm being favored. God is favoring me. God is making me more awesome because he's giving me those arrows. That's very important. I mean, that's not the centerpiece of the passage here. <laughs> I opened a, lot, a big window here. Yeah, let me move forward. So continuing on verse 8 to verse 11. So Jacob, uh, Esau asks, what about all these animals? And Jacob is quite upfront. This is to find favor with you. Yet again, the word there, favor. I want to find favor in your eyes. And, Jacob, and Esau replies, Yeah, you know, man, I have enough. You, you keep your stuff. Thank you, thank you, but no thank you. Most likely, this was the etiquette of the time. You know when somebody gives you stuff and you say, Oh, come on, you shouldn't have that kind of stuff, you know? But maybe that's what he's doing. You don't just say, wow, for me, really? Give it to me. My wife tells me that in Korea, you, you say no three times before you say yes. Sounds exhausting. I, I want to say yes before the person asked. <laughs> but that's the etiquette of the time. But Jacob insists. And Jacob does well in insisting for psychological reasons, but also for moral reasons, for biblical reasons. Psychological because, brother, I, I want to have a visible element that I can remember in order to know that we are doing well with each other, that we are okay with each other. That's a psychological aspect. But also there is a biblical ground here. The Bible says that when we wrong someone, we ought, we must, not an option, we must make restitution. Now, whenever possible. Let's say you and I have a fight one day and, uh, and I offend you. I offend you badly. There's, I can make my apologies, but I cannot undo the offense, right? So there are some things that you cannot make restitution for it. You can apologize, you can promise not to do it again, and you can show proper contrition. But there's no paying back of an offense. But there are some things that you can pay back. And on this case, he could pay back. Because he stole the specific, the, the blessing, and that came with a fina uh, financial aspect to it. So he's saying, brother, now interestingly, the father is not even dead. So nobody was entitled to any inheritance because the father was still alive. But he said, you know what? Here, here's the money right now. I did that because I wanted your money. I went after your money. Here's, here's the money back. I never got it, but here's the money back. Repented heart. We say repented heart. The Bible says, Jesus, our Lord Jesus, said, if you are offering a sacrifice, an offering, if you are offering an offering, eh? at that time, remember that they would bring an animal to be sacrificed at the altar. And Jesus said, if you, if you get there, all the way there, and you remember somebody has something against you, you leave your animal there, you know, you tie your animal there and tell the priest, wait a second, go, settle your issue, come back and do the offering. What is Jesus' point? First come obedience, then sacrifice. First come obedience, then sacrifice. And this is very in tune with what we're going to see next here on the same chapter. So Jacob insisted. Esau said, okay, you know, you have it. Uh, you, you got it. I will accept your gift. Now, Esau appears to be very generous. Come with me. Let's, let's take our way. Let, let's, oh, let's travel together. Now, Esau, no, Jacob exaggerates on his hands. Look at this. My Lord knows that the children are weak and the flocks or herds are which are nursing are with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Oh, really? All the flock? One day. 
If you drive them too hard, all will die. Of course, he's exaggerating here. But his point is, he want to say no to Esau, but gently. He doesn't want to say to his face, like, N-O, no. He doesn't want to do that. He want to be gentle about it. After all, the, convers- the, the relationship just got back together, you know. They are just beginning to work things. Things are just starting to look good. So he doesn't want to jeopardize that s- delicate situation. And then Esau, still kind, magnanimous, tells him, okay, I'll leave some, some men with you so they'll help you out and protect you. Dangerous area here, you know, most likely that's what he meant, I imagine. And he said, oh, my brother, let me find favor in your eyes. So, yeah, you found favor in my eyes. That's why I'm offering people to you. But, you know, he wants to say no, but in a polite manner. Now, here's the problem. He lied. I will lead, end of verse 14, I will lead on slowly at the pace which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. Now, for, I want to take back what I said. I said he lied. I want to take that back. There are two views on the matter. Some people say he lied. Some people say he didn't. I'll explain why. He said, I will go to meet you in Seir. So they're coming from the north. He just crossed the little river, the tiny stream called Yabok, the ford, the ford, the ford of Yabok. So he just crossed. Seir is the region on the bottom, on the south. But the location where they were right then and there, or a little bit further south, was called Seir. Now, the Bible says that Jacob went all the way to Succoth. Now, where is Succoth? Is Succoth in the region of Seir or not? I, almost everybody, actually no, pretty much everybody that I read said that he lied. Because Succoth is north of the stream that he just crossed. So he told his brother, brother, I'm going to meet you down south. But as soon as the brother left, he went up north. So they say they lie. I got another other theologians that say, I mean, it's just a matter of geography on the end of the day, right? But I checked an atlas that showed Succoth south of the Ford of Yabok. Other atlases put Succoth on the north. So did he lie or not? I don't know. Okay, I don't know. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I can, I'm not going to take a final position because I'm not sure. But here's what I'm going to take a final position. He disobeyed God. He disobeyed God. When he was in Padam Aram, in the house of his father-in-law, what did God told him? Go back to the house of your father. Go back to the land of your father. That's not. Canaan is the land. And particularly, he should have gone back to Beth El. Remember? When he was running away from his brother, God appeared to him where? On a place called Luz. And then Jacob said, this is the house of God. This place will be called Beth El, house of God. And on that place, God said, Jacob, I will bring you back. So when Jacob was in Beth El, God said, I'll bring you back. So when God told him later, go back, where should I have you gone back to? Beth El. But no. He's, he went to Sukkoth, and he built booths there for his animals. Sukkoth, whether if it's north or south of the stream of waters called Ford of Yabok, whether or not if it's north or south, it's a fertile land. Lands that are at the margins of rivers are almost always, if not always, quite green, quite Good, quite convenient for people that own a lot of cattle. It's quite convenient. So most likely, that's what I think, Jacob thought, I I just spent a whole lot of money giving this gift to Esau. So I got to build back my finances. Maybe that's what he thought. So God had told him, go to Bethel. Go back. 
Did he go to Bethel? No. He went to Sukkoth. He was not even in Canaan. Canaan is on the west of the Jordan. He was east of the Jordan. He did not even enter the promised land yet. But then, after he leaves Sukkoth, then he finally enters Canaan. Then all is well, right? Wrong. He should have gone to Bethel. Actually, on chapter 35, verse 1, God will tell him, go to Bethel. God will say that specifically on chapter 35. So we see that when he entered Canaan, he went to Shashem. We have a problem then. Now you see, I don't know if Jacob lied or not to his brother. Maybe he did. But one thing I'm sure, Jacob did not obey the Lord. The Lord told him, go back. He should have gone to the place where God said, I'll bring you back, which is Bethel. And no, he went to Shechem. Now, you see, Jacob did half obedience. What is the other word for half obedience? Begins with D, one word. Disobedience. That's it. He disobeyed God. Now, he did something nice. He went to Canaan, but not to the right city. And he sacrificed, right? Look at that. No, Jacob is on fire. Verse 20. Then he erected an altar there and called it El Elohe Israel, the God of Israel. He's offering sacrifices. Isn't he nice? Samuel once spoke to a king. I think it was King Saul. I think it was him. It is better to obey than to sacrifice. Jacob was sacrificing. Good. But he was not obeying. That's a half obedience, which we call disobedience. Now, now but he's no longer Jacob, he's Israel. Yet, disobeying. What, is, what does that mean to you? I hope you are a born again Christian, like, like I believe like I wholeheartedly believe that Jacob was at this time. He's not even Jacob, he's now Israel. And yet he's disobeying the Lord. And yet his obedience is half-hearted. We are always like that. I'm not saying maybe you are like this, I'm saying you are like that. You are Israel of God, I believe. I am Israel of God. And yet we have so much to sanctify, to, so much sanctification to work at. That's the bad news. But I want to bring you also the good news. The good news is that the works of Christ are phenomenal. You see what God did to Esau, caused Esau to forgive. And for the rest of the Bible, we never see Esau coming to Jacob and saying, you know, I forgave you, but I'm pretty upset about our past. Isn't that often that we see people that claim to forgive others, but when they want to treat the other person, they treat as if there was never any forgiveness in the first place? How many, how many times have we heard of husbands and wives that they say they forgave each other, but then they throw back the past right on their faces as soon as they have a discussion, as soon as they have an argument? How often that is? But that's not how Jesus works. Let me tell you how Jesus works. Jesus works like this. Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west. How far is that? Oh, well, that's as far as it gets. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's what you're going to be singing. Psalm number 103. That's what we're going to be singing, right? Now, before we even sing, remember that to forgive is to be like Christ. Christ forgave us our sins and trespasses, and so we must forgive others. And remember, sanctification is a lifelong event. You are to work. I am to work on our sanctification until the day we die. Actually, there is a place in the Bible that the Apostle Paul 
did not use the word sanctification. He used the following expression. Work out your salvation. Not work for. No, 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 no. You already have the salvation. So he said, work that out. Put that to work. So sanctify yourself. Now, God will always have his way. That's something that is quite sad on this chapter. He went to Shashem, right? Do you guys know what will happen in Shashem? One of Jacob's, sis, one of Jacob's daughter, actually his daughter, Dina, should be raped there. And three brothers will be so angry that they will go on a murder spree and they will kill all the guys, all the men, all the adult males of an entire city. If Jacob would never have gone to Shechem, and he should have, should have never been there in the first place, none of that would have happened. God allowed that to happen, so God would move him out of Shechem to the place that he said he should go. God will always have his place, his final word. The final word will always be his. Now, how much better it will be for us if we get there through love and not through pain? If it's through pain, so be it. For as long as we, we are where the Lord wants us to be. But if we go by love, that's much better. Let us pray. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. O oh Lord God Almighty, it is better to obey than to sacrifice. Let us obey you. O oh God, it is better one day in your presence than a thousand or a million or a billion days outside of your presence. O oh Lord, it is better to be the tiniest in heaven than the largest in hell. O oh Lord, give us the mentality of the fighter, the warrior, not the chicken mentality. O oh Lord, let us walk with you and love you, knowing that every born again Christian enjoys not only your grace, not only your forgiveness, but your favor. Oh God, may we be people that are big. May we be big on favor. For Lord, with your favor, there is nothing that your people cannot do. Favor us, oh Lord. Favor our church. Prosper our church. Prosper our families. Favor our families. Favor all the individuals. Blessed be your name forever. In Jesus' name, amen.